um, the economy versus public health is a false dichotomy that lots of Wall Streeters would like us to believe is real. Our next guest argues that the health of the economy is dependent on the health of the people who drive it. Dean Baker, macroeconomist and co-founder of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, joins us now. Hi, Dean. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Well, <laughs> I'm in, where are you? For, are you in, what part of our nation are you in? I'm in, I'm in Southern Utah. Oh, so how is, uh, how is Southern Utah responding to the coronavirus at this point? Well, it's kind of interesting. I'm in this small town, about 5,000 people, and, you know, very conservative, overwhelmingly Republican. And it's kind of striking. I mean, people are really stepping up. It's, you know, it's kind of this community sense. And, you know, I mean, part of it, I'm sure, is that it's overwhelmingly white. Um, I suspect that makes it easier. Or I shouldn't say easier, but easier for these people, at least. But, you know, people are doing what you want to see doing, you know, so the grocery stores restricting uh, uh, sales of milk and um, uh, toilet paper, <laughs> whatever, you know, so, so we're joking about, we were saying we thought we'd only get rationing if Bernie Sanders was elected. Um, <laughs> Very funny. That's... <laughs> But, but anyhow, yeah, uh -huh. we're doing okay. I don't know how about you're, you're in New York, I gather. I'm in New York. It's, you know, it's a little crazier here than anywhere else. And I have been talking on this program for quite a while about how even in upstate New York, where Sinclair Media and Fox News and it's, it's a, you know, it's a working class area that has turned red from being blue. So there's a whole bunch of dynamics in there. The people really aren't taking it seriously. They are listening to Donald Trump and thinking... Uh, you know, oh, by Easter, this will all be over. And um, People I had relatives just do take it seriously. I, I've been encouraged by that, you know, that uh, they're trying to take precautions and, you know, basically doing the things you'd want them to do. Um, I, we do have some people who are, you know, upset. Our governor was one of the first to to uh, clamp down and close uh, schools and businesses, you know, even when we didn't have that many infections, we still don't have that many. We have like 400. It's a smaller state, obviously, in New York or whatever. But, you know, scheme of things, that's not too bad. Um, but he did take it seriously. And uh, again, we have some politicians in the state that are criticizing him for it. We're a tourism state and shutting down hotels and restaurants. Is, it's a big deal. Um, but he, you but know, tourism he right was going to dry up anyway, just shutting down the hotels didn't stop tourism. The coronavirus stopped tourism. No one wants to fly now. No one wants to go anywhere. Well, people could drive here and, uh, you know, so I shouldn't advertise it, but yeah, you know, you could still get here. But. Don't come, especially if you're from Come, here. yeah. <laughs> Is there a place I could come out and quarantine? Um, okay, so we have questions already coming in about the economy, but let's just, uh, let's start with what we're gonna ask you for about, and then we'll get to the questions. Um, your, your most recent piece, The Shape of Recovery, Those Who Tell Don't Know, uh, one of the things you said, the important thing to know about the forecasts is that the people making these forecasts don't have a clue what they're talking about. Can we talk about um, what you believe is on the horizon? Yeah, well, just to be clear, what I was saying in that piece, I don't have a clue. So, you know, there have been these pieces, I've seen them in the New York Times, Washington Post, telling us what the recovery is going to look like. And I'm just going, you people have no basis for any idea, you know, I mean, because these are people as economists, they're speaking as, you know, either economists, people experts in economic policy. This isn't an economic policy question. This is first and foremost an epidemiology question. So tell me the path of the coronavirus, then I could give you some idea what the economy is going to look like. But I don't know. They don't know. I mean, is it, you know, in two months, that would be, I think, a very optimistic scenario. But let's say in two months that we have reasonably well under control, we've improved treatments so that you know, the, for t the mortality rate is not that much different than with a normal flu, well then fine, you know, you reopen and you try to protect most vulnerable. I mean, that's, you know, that I think is a very optimistic scenario, but let's hope not altogether implausible. So if that's the case, what would the economy look like? Probably pretty good. We put a lot of money in people's pockets. Um, they're going to go out and spend. I mean, one concern I have that I, you know, unfortunately, I don't think it's been taken seriously enough. We want to keep people tied to firms. And I've been, you know, trying to argue with this, you know, talking to staffers, congressional staffers and, and others that as, uh, as we structure 
um, I, I think stimulus is really the wrong term. I was calling an economic survival package, you know, trying to get through this period of, you know, however long, one month, two months, three months, we don't know. We want to make sure that people have a job to come back to, which is both important to them. And ideally, they continue not just their pay, but ideally their health care benefits through this period. But then on top of that, on the other side, you don't want to, you know, we get two months, three months out, you want to go, okay, all clear. And then these businesses go, great. Um, now I got to hire people. I have to train them. Um, that would really be very chaotic. So I've been trying to encourage the people I've been in contact with structure this damn thing so that we encourage people to be tied to their firms so they have they have a job to go back to and the businesses have a workforce. And anyhow, if we did that, which we did a little bit, the, the loans for small businesses were, were that was a well done. That was a good idea, which they did for large businesses too. But in any case, um, if they're in a situation get up and running, then when this is over, two months, three months out, people haven't been able to, you know, go out for dinner. They've been able to go to a movie. They have money in their pocket. I, I think that's actually probably a pretty strong recovery story. So anyhow, so I'm just saying the people saying, oh, it's going to be awful and long lasting. Again, I could think of stories with the virus where that would be true, but that's not the economy. That's the virus. Um, a question coming in from Lecton. Do you think that the world ever truly recovered from the 2007-8 market crash? No, it didn't. And that was really just because of bad policy. Um, we had this, you know, it really is obscene. And, you know, people don't beat up on the Republicans for nearly as much as they deserve because, you know, Obama <laughs> we was- try. We give it a try. <laughs> you can't possibly beat them. No, seriously, seriously, because let, let me explain the story. I mean, they, Obama was overly cautious with his stimulus, but all along he was saying, oh, I couldn't get a bigger package through. You know, again, part of that was his own reservations, but part of that was true, that the Republicans, Mitch McConnell came right out and said, my job is to make Barack Obama one-term president. And the best way to do it, and he's right, was make sure that the economy was really bad. And, you know, the economy wasn't really bad in 2012, but we certainly had not recovered from the, from the crash in 2008, 2009. And so this was just unbelievably cynical and ostensibly, you know, they said, oh, we're concerned about budget deficits. We're really concerned about budget deficits. Then, you know. No one cares it, about that now, apparently. Yeah. Well, they didn't care about when Donald Trump proposed the $2 trillion tax cut or $200 billion a year, about 1% GDP. It's real money. And now, you know, they're just throwing money out as, you know, which is the right thing to do. I mean, you don't worry about the budget deficit right now. I agree with that. But you can't tell me a story that, oh, my God, the budget deficit, the budget deficit, the budget deficit, when you have a Democrat in the White House is trying to do things, get the economy going again, wants to build infrastructure, combat social uh, clim uh, climate change, you know, the, the whole Obama agenda. You know, again, he wasn't aggressive enough. I could blame him for that. But there's no doubt the Republicans were trying to block him every step of the way. So they were for political advantage. They were prepared to keep people out of work. Basically, you know, you look at things like healthcare, people die. You know, they think that's really funny, you know. So, yeah, no, you can't possibly beat up on the Republicans enough. It's just, they're really disgraceful. It, it seems as though there are some who see the economy and public health as separate and competing with each other. Can you talk about why that is obviously wrong? Yeah, you know, you have a number of governors in the country, uh, not always as quick. I'll mention our governor, I think, was fairly quick. Uh, Cuomo in New York should have been quicker, but, you know, he did do the right thing, shutting down, you know, businesses there. And yeah, that's bad for the economy. But you go, okay, so what is the alternative? Let's just say you go, oh, we'll just, uh, you know, we'll just party, you know, we'll have fun, you know. Well, you're going to have millions of people die. You'll have tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions getting sick. Is that going to be good for business? I mean, the idea, OK, we're going to make restaurants close. OK, so that's heavy handed government, bad for the economy. Who's going to go to a restaurant if they expect to get coronavirus and possibly die from it? You know, th th that's not a good business strategy. No. Uh, come to our rest, eat at our restaurant and die. You know, I I'd love to see those ads, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Risk your life, but the pasta's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, boy. So Trump says he wants to reopen the economy by Easter. What would the impact of that be? You know, I mean, I, I'm continually amazed by Trump's, you know, I don't know what to call it, ignorance, stupidity, whatever you want to say. I mean, he's not basing this on anything. There's no public health expert anywhere. Maybe he could pay someone, but, you know, there's no public health expert anywhere who thinks this is two weeks away we're talking about, two weeks from Sunday. 
He thinks that we're going to have the virus under control two weeks from Sunday. He's talking about crowded church pews. Does he want all these people to die? He does. I mean, it's just, just, <laughs> he you know, doesn't want to pay for Medicare. He wants. Yeah, they will pay. save money that way. I, I, it is just astounding. He would suggest that, and it's you know, again, if we're just some jerk on the street, you go, okay, people say stupid things all the time. He's the president, and for better or worse, people do pay attention to him. You're going to have people who think, oh, this is going away. I could go out and see my friends. We're going to go to the bar and have drinks or, you know, whatever. This is, you're going to get a lot. You probably already has had a lot of people die because, you know, there he is saying it's no big deal. In two weeks, it's all going to be over. Uh, you know, it just, it just is incredible. Um, Dean, do you see a future after the COVID-19? I know you said nobody knows, but you know, in which our economy goes back to the normal that we knew, which was not so great for the environment, not so great for, uh, you know, in terms of wealth inequality, or is it possible that after the disaster, we could see a, a restructuring of the systems that we know now? Can you, can you give us an idea of what that might might look like? Well, for better or worse, I don't think we're going to see much by way of improvements. I just don't think there's enough, you know, organization of coherence in, in an opposition. I mean, we have things out there, but, you know, you know, great, Medicare for all. We're going to see that? I, I don't see that scenario. What would that look like? You know, so, so you know, hopefully we'll get more support for extending health care coverage. I mean, one of the things, and again, this is just kind of painful. We had big fight initially. They go, oh, okay, we're going to free testing for everyone. Well, that's good. But if someone doesn't isn't insured or has uh, very poor insurance, so they're going to be faced with thousands of dollars of medical bills. A lot of people aren't going to go test it, you know, because what's it going to tell you? It either tells you that you you don't have it. Well, that's good news, but you know, you probably already thought that. Or alternatively, it tells you you do have it. Now you're going to have thousands of dollars of medical bills that you can't pay. Now, one of the good things we did get in this legislation that I, I guess will pass today. I don't know for sure, but the Senate passed um, that that provides for free health care for most people who, who uh, test positive. So if you're covered Medicare, Medicaid, it's supposed to pay for that. I think it covers everything. I'm not 100% sure. You may sell some co-pays there. And, and it requires private insurers to, to pay for treatment for, for the coronavirus. But there's still a lot of gaps there. So it's still not universal. But it was a big step forward. But the fact was, we had to fight for it. It's just kind of like, this should be common sense. So even if you don't care about the victims, which you'd kind of hope people would, but whatever, let's say you don't care about them. Since we want to get the virus under control, to do that, we have to get people tested and know who's positive. And if you tell people, oh, you get tested and you might face thousands of dollars in medical bills that you can't afford, they won't get tested. Um, questions coming in from our stream chat uh, from T. Lurker. As an intellectual property expert, can Dean explain how medical patents hinder the treatment of the disease? Well, there's two parts of this story. Um, one is in the development of, you know, a cure or a treatment or, or for that matter, a vaccine. Um, the patent, patent monopolies are a, a way to provide incentive. And what that means is that you're discouraging cooperation. So, you know, if you're researching, uh, trying to develop a vaccine or a cure or treatment in Germany, you don't want to cooperate with people in the United States or China or elsewhere. Um, now, fortunately, I've heard that there have been several efforts to arrange for collaborative development. So what you want, and there's a great model here, when people work on the Human Genome Project back in the 90s, they had what they called the Bermuda Principles, where they posted their results as quickly as possible, ideally nightly, so that researchers everywhere in the world could see, oh, this is what was done in this lab in, in Boston or this lab in, in Germany or whatever. They all benefit from each other's research. Science so the patent for the people. system, excuse me? Science for the people. Exactly. And you know that's how science advances most quickly. That shouldn't be a radical proposition. But patent monopolies encourages the opposite. So that's, that's been an issue in the development of a vaccine that's at least partly been overcome. But the other part of the story is that it, the, the monopoly, of course, makes the makes these things expensive. It's one of these things that, you know, I almost, I, I, I like to say drugs are cheap and people think I'm a lunatic. I go, no, they're cheap to make. They're cheap to distribute. So when you hear of a drug costing, you know, $100,000, it doesn't cost $100,000. That's what they're charging for it. You know, what it actually costs the manufacturer to make it and distribute it safely, probably $300, $400, $500. We know this because that's in, in countries where there aren't patent monopolies, you get the same drug often for less than 1% of the price. 
So that's been an issue with with the treatment of the coronavirus that, you know, some of these some of these treatments are likely to be very expensive. And, you know, there, there was an issue, I think, it was in the Netherlands where you had I may be uh, defaming the wrong company, but I believe it was Gilead wasn't able to produce enough of the particular drug that's being used and they refused to license the patent so someone else could do it. So it's just like, wow. oh my God, you guys are gonna have people die, you know, cause they can't get the treatment and you yourself, you're not in a position to, to produce it. Now that may have changed. They face a lot of public pressure so they may have given in on that. But you know, this is the sort of thing we shouldn't have to argue about. The drug's been developed, just produce it and give it to people. Dean, the New York Post is reporting that some doctors here in the U.S. are using a treatment that has been uh, used, I believe it's in China or South Korea, which is high doses of intravenous vitamin C. Now, vitamin C is something that cannot be patented, and uh, both doc doctors here and doctors um, uh, there are reporting that the, the, the coronavirus cases who have been given these high doses do much better than the other ones. It's not necessarily a cure, but it allows the body to recover. Uh, now let's talk about the fact that you can't patent vitamin C. Um, you know, that's the reason that there aren't any studies done. And now you have people on the internet saying, oh, well, this obviously doesn't work because it's not, you know, there's the studies are saying this, but I keep trying to make the point that the studies are only you know, most studies are being done in the effort to make a patent so that somebody can make money. And since you can't patent vitamin C, the proper studies aren't going to be done. And so- Yes, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly, you know, again, another problem with, you know, relying on patent monopolies to fund research. Now, I know nothing about this, but, I'm, you know, so I've heard it too, but I mean, I have no idea. I'm not a, you know, a medical researcher, so I can't comment on its actual effectiveness. But that's, again, another big problem that drug companies have no interest in pursuing research into possible cures or treatments that aren't patentable. So that simply will be neglected. And it actually goes a step further that when they have a patentable item, they have incentive to misrepresent the safety and effectiveness. And if that sounds strange, um, people have heard of the opioid epidemic. Um, suppose Purdue Pharma did not have a patent uh, on oxycodone, you know, so suppose it was being sold as a cheap generic. Now, people lie about all sorts of things. If I want to sell you a paper cup, I might lie to you about, oh, this is the best paper cup or whatever, but I'm not going to do that much to lie to you because I'm going to get 10 cents for the paper cup. You know, on the other hand, if I got $1,000 for the paper cup, I'd have more incentive to lie to you. And that's exactly what happens with patent monopolies, that it gives companies enormous incentive to misrepresent the safety and effectiveness of their drugs. And they do it literally all the time. Again, the opioid epidemic is the, the most egregious example, but you don't have to look far. It happens all the time. And that's just the nature of the incentive. Any good economist should recognize that. We, you know, yeah. we have a government intervention that creates this monopoly. So the idea that we could actually trust whatever comes out of wherever uh, to actually be the best treatment is is you know that the trust becomes eroded in these large established companies because of the profit motive yeah well there's literally no reason to trust them because they have every incentive in the world in the world to misrepresent the safety and effectiveness of their product and you know on a rare day they do get caught and they may have to pay penalties but you know that's uh, these, these are intelligent people. They can do the calculation and go, okay, I can get an extra billion dollars. There's a one in 10 chance I get caught. And if I get caught, maybe we'll pay a, you know, $2 billion fine or something. We're way ahead. So, you know, that that's exactly what they're doing. I guarantee you that is exactly, you know, because sometimes that comes public, but again, we, we don't even have to speculate too much. They're there to make a profit. You know, that's, it's as simple as that. You know, the, the head of Pfizer doesn't go to his board I believe it's a man, whoever, man or woman, I'm pretty sure it's a man, but you know, he's not yeah, going to go to his, sure it's a man too. <laughs> yeah. No, he's not going to go to the board and go, you know, we didn't really make any money last year. Our stock price really didn't go anywhere, but you know, we delivered this drug that saved tens of millions of people. They'll go, that's nice, but when are we going to make money? I mean, that's, that's what they're trying to do. That's what they're in business for. And anyone tells you otherwise, that's just a lie. I mean, it's not that they're evil, but that's, they're there to make money. So, you know, if they could do something good in the process, that's wonderful, but they're there to make money, full stop. Uh, questions coming in from the chat from Lauren, according to French economist, Thomas uh, Piketty's book, Piketty. Capital, uh, 2014, capitalism when uh, wherever it has become the dominant economic and political system in historic 
in history leads to greater wealth inequality and that all attempts to alter this is temporary. How can we secure a reduction in wealth inequality in a coronavirus era economy? Well, I think he's, Piketty's book, it's a great book. I, you know, I enjoyed reading. He's a very good, well, I read, of course, in English. I'm not, a, I mean, I'm some French, but I wasn't going to read a 700 page book in French. Anyhow, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, it's a very good book. So I encourage people to look at it. A lot of good material in there. But I think his basic hypothesis is kind of questionable because he goes, there's this tendency in capitalism that, you know, we always get more wealth inequality. Well, we have a major exception to that, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And he goes, well, that's just one period. You go, well, that's 40 years, you know? And we actually don't have, I mean, the book goes back to, to Rome and go, I don't know if I'd consider Rome modern capitalism. I mean, it's so, so I, I disagree with his basic theory. And just to get back to the point we we're talking about a moment ago, capitalism could be structured a million different ways. So like it or not, we, it's an infinitely malleable system. So we were just talking about the drug companies. Well, suppose we didn't have patent monopolies. You know, that comes from the government. That's not intrinsic to capitalism. We don't have to have patent monopolies or we could have them be shorter. We could have them be weaker. So, so to most, tomorrow we said, okay, we're not gonna have patent monopolies. We could still have private drug companies even. I'm not, you know, suppose we paid drug companies to do research and uh, you know everything's open in the public domain. And when they develop a new drug, guess what? It's a cheap generic from day one. It's going to sell for twenty dollars a prescription, not a thousand dollars. You know, we could do that. That's still capitalism. Uh, we could so we could structure capitalism a thousand different ways. And what I, I you know what I find problematic in sort of the Piketty analysis, it sort of treats it like, oh my god. God, we just have this inequality machine. What are we going to do? And, you know, we could have taxes and that's fine. I'm all for progressive taxes. But I think more importantly, don't structure the system to distribute income upwards. And that's what we've done. You know, another area, I'll, I'll shut up in a second on this, but okay. another big area where we know we create great fortunes is the financial sector. Well, we could rein in the financial sector, have a financial transactions tax, cut the volume of trading. This allows these hedge fund guys to get enormously rich. They rip off our public pension funds. So require the pension funds to have full disclosure of their contracts with the hedge funds and private equity guys who make out like bandits at the expense of the pension funds. Still capitalism. So, so there's a lot of things we could do to change the structure of the economy that would prevent the gross inequalities that we see. Uh, we're speaking with Dean Baker. Dean, your blog, Beat the Press, provides commentary on economic reporting. It's not just commentary, though. It is like, uh, you know, an alternative to what you're seeing when you're watching, say, you know, the, uh, I don't watch any of those shows. <laughs> Larry Kudlow? Who are these people? I don't know. Um, what are you talking about now? Because what I was talking about right before you came on was the fact that yesterday they were saying historic gains in the stock market. And they forgot to mention, you know, after historic drop, like all the headlines were, you know, historic gains as opposed to stock market back to where it was four weeks ago, as opposed to, you know, just the way they report it makes my head explode. Well, one of the things I've written about a fair bit, and I'm going to have to write a lot more, I think, is just, you know, literally what the stock market is. So <laughs> there, there's the, this conventional wisdom that somehow the stock market's a measure of the economy. And it's not even, this isn't like a radical lefty proposition. This is the textbook economic definition. The stock market, the value of the stock market is in principle the value of future corporate profits. So suppose we did something that was likely to increase the profit share of GDP. So we did something like had a big corporate tax cut. Well, be very surprised if that didn't send the stock market up because corporations are getting more profits after their taxes because they're paying less money in taxes. Now, should the rest of us be celebrating that? Well, we're gonna have to pay more taxes, other things equal. So why on earth would we be happy about this rise in the stock market? What that's saying is that we're gonna have a higher tax burden because they're gonna have a lower one. So, you know, and that's across the board. Suppose we outlawed unions. Uh, that, that probably is somewhere on the Republican agenda. Well, that would probably be a good thing for the stock market because presumably that means wages will drop to some extent, profits will be higher. So it's not, it's not even in principle. And again, this is the textbook definition. That's not like some alternative, you know, that is what the stock market is measuring. And, you know, I've tried to explain to people that if you have some sort of progressive agenda, whatever it might be, if you're not prepared to see the stock market go down and possibly a lot, 
then you're not serious about it because that is what will happen. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You know, if if we got uh, well, even Biden say he wants to raise the corporate income tax rate. So if he gets in there and he's in a position to do that, that will lower the stock market. So if you're not prepared to see a substantial decline in the stock market, you're not interested in progressive policies, full stop. There's just no way around that. I think you've got a squirrel in the yard. <laughs> yes, my dog feels strongly about it. <laughs> like, let me tell you. Yeah, well, so. Let me uh, go close the door here. Be oh, a little quiet. Okay. <laughs> We're talking with Dean Baker. He's the senior economist for the Center for Economic and Policy. <laughs> Research. If you have any additional questions you want to ask Dean when he gets back from letting the dog out, literally, who let the dogs out? Dean, yeah. um, put them in the stream chat and I will ask them. So, Dean, when all of this reporting about stock market crashing um, makes sort of, you know, not to use an old cliched dichotomy, Main Street think, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my job. But people are losing their jobs because the coronavirus is shuttering businesses. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, again, we have to think separately about the economy and the stock market. So the stock market didn't cause anyone to lose their job. The, the coronavirus was causing restaurants to close, uh, hotels, bars, all these other businesses. No one's traveling. So obviously people getting laid off in the airlines and other travel related businesses. So that's what's causing people to lose their jobs. Had basically nothing to do with the stock market. So I understand a lot of people have 401ks because traditional pensions are, are dying rapidly, um, you know, defined benefit pensions. So I understand that. I mean, I have 401k too. I'm not happy in that sense, but you know, it's, that's, that's part of the story. And, you know, I think it's unfortunate that so many people have come to think, oh my God, our, our prosperity depends on the stock market. And, you know, it is also, you know, better or worse, most people, when they have a 401k, they don't have much money in it. So, you know, let's say you have 40,000 in 401k and the market goes down 20%. Okay, you lost 8,000, you're not happy, but how's that compared to losing a job? I mean, it's, so people have much more at stake with the real economy, you know, what's actually going on in the economy, whether they have a job, a decent paying job, healthcare benefits on down the list, than the stock market, except for, you know, a pretty small minority that has, you know, let's say two, three, four hundred thousand, or of course that very small minority that has millions in the market. I really don't see how we're gonna ever get back to quote unquote normal, a normal or what was normal before that. And I personally see that that might be a positive given um, the state of crisis that we're in around uh, climate change, that, that something needs to be done. Now, I don't know if you heard about this and this just happened this morning, but right before, now I'm just pummeling you with uh, <laughs> questions that I am interested in your expertise on. But Donald Trump uh, decided to suspend all environmental regulations uh, due to the coronavirus. And that was reported by The Hill this morning. What kind of economic impact do you foresee that happening? Uh, for Excuse me, foresee that having in the future? Well, I mean, it really will depend how far that goes how long it's in place in other words and also whether the courts allow it i mean it's it's just obscene i you know it, th this guy is evil the devil <laughs> horrible dumber than anything that's ever moved i mean this is not going to help the economy i mean what does it mean okay we don't have lead we we could put all the lead we want in our drinking water you know i i, I just like um yeah you know, we've been joking, they should call it, he, he wants to use his racist line, the China virus, we should call it the Trump global warming. I mean, it's just, it's just like, what the hell do you hope to accomplish with that? It's, uh, you know, it, it's it just incredibly vile. Because um, again, I mean, seriously, what, what good could you possibly we're going to tell the auto industry stop having emission controls. They'll go, oh, okay, we'll go redesign our cars so they pollute as much as they did 50 years ago. I mean, what on earth could he possibly think is beneficial in that? Now, if you were, if the guy were one hundredth of a serious person, he might say, okay, here's a particular environmental regulation was supposed to go in effect next month, and because of the coronavirus, we'll give them a delay for you know two months. That could be a reasonable thing to do. But across the board, I mean, I, it's across the board with no end date, no end date. Just I can't even. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. there, there used to be some bipartisan support. You know, Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency, so the idea that we cared about the environment was not a radical left-wing position. 
but apparently, you know, Isn't the idea is also like a like a strategic in, in economic position to not like destroy the planet upon which you rely for life. Well, yeah, I mean, we have enormous economic costs associated with environment. You know, obviously, we're seeing this with global warming. I mean, he wants to pretend that, you know, it doesn't exist. Well, we get these storms, you know, a few years ago with uh, um, Superstorm Sandy, was it, that hit, you know, the New York area. Well, you know, we can't say for certain what that would have looked like if we hadn't had increasing temperatures, but we know that this worsens storms, worsens extreme um, uh, um, uh, climate events, and that has a real economic cost. I mean, people lose their homes. That's a real cost. People can't get insurance on their homes. There's large parts of the country that insurers are not willing to issue insurance on their homes because they're low-lying areas that are close to the ocean or lakes or rivers, and they go, no, we, you know, they're not as stupid as Donald Trump. And they, yet they, real estate agents will still try to sell you that house. I've noticed myself. Yes, they <laughs> will. They will. Them because they think they're listening to Donald Trump and these right wing ideologues. And they're saying things they're they're like, it's the same with the coronavirus. This isn't happening. Oh, no big deal. You know, I'll just buy this house on the, near the beach and it'll be fine. You know, that storm happens once every you know, thousand years. So it already happened. So I can just buy on the beach in Long Island, you know. Oh. Well, here, the, the plus side on this, and this is kind of the economy doing what you want it to do. You can't get a home unless you have insurance on it. I mean, they, I'm sorry, you can't get a mortgage unless you have insurance. I, mean, I want to be careful with, my, with what I'm saying here. And most people do need a mortgage when they buy a house. So unless you could pay cash, you have to get a mortgage, you have to get insurance. And the insurance companies are saying now, wait a second, you're right next to the ocean. This house is going to be underwater. We're not going to insure you. They don't want to lose money. They're not in business to lose money, even if that well, might capitalism be Capitalism is going to save us. <laughs> well, in that part of the story, it actually does what you want it to do. You know, so I'm mean, again, I'm not, no, believe me, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, baby. we need government <laughs> regulations here because it's, I, I mean, you know, this is, again, it's a classic story that, you know, this is left or right wing economists. If I have the option, I'm building a house and I have the option, I could either build a proper septic system or just dump my sewage on your lawn. Well, it's cheaper for me to just dump your sewage on your lawn. Now, we don't allow that because, you know, my savings is your cost. You said it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back on the program. I've missed you since we switched from uh, audio only to video. So... Um, and I think Alana tells me that you are going to be regularly appearing here. Is that accurate? I'm just pressuring you. <laughs> oh, I think you're frozen, Dean. I don't know what happened with the internet, but I think you are frozen. I don't know if you can hear me still, but hopefully you'll unfreeze in a brief moment. We've been speaking with Dean Baker, co-founder of the Center for Economic and Policy Research in 1999. His areas of research include housing. Oh, I didn't get to ask him about the strike rent and the mortgage thing. Not mortgage, but I think he's gone. <laughs> yeah, he fell off. Bummer. Well, we'll ask him next time he comes on about, um, you know, why do they have to pay their mortgages if I don't have to pay my rent? Uh, anyway, uh, you can find him on his blog, Beat the Press, which is awesome. So I hope you enjoyed that. I definitely thought it was pretty great. And now it's time for a, a segment of refreshment. I thought you guys were hilarious in the chat, by the way. <laughs> all of the people, all of the names we called Trump. That was really fun to read. Narcissistic, corrupt, says Chosen Family. The list is endless. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, Bethos thirty says I love the description. Dumber than anything that moves. I don't think he's dumb. Well, maybe I think he's literally evil. I, I think agree. there's. Oh, are I you? Agree. Are you back? I'm back. Oh, you that's rid of so me. great. I'm so no. I was like, I don't know what's happening. So I'm glad. I'm glad you're back because we wanted to ask you. Um, the questions that are related to, um, you know, people not having to pay their mortgage for a certain amount of time. Why do I still have to pay my rent, Dean? <laughs> Who's That's a good profit question. Off this? I mean, it would be good if they did. And I'm not, I, I haven't read through everything in that bill, obviously, but you know, if there were some moratoriums and again, I'm not sure how much this could be done at the federal level, but moratoriums on evictions and, uh, and foreclosures. Now, as a practical matter, I think it would probably be very hard for someone to actually do an eviction right now. I mean, you have to go to court. And, Court's you know. closed. Yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, the, the, the main thing, I, you know, I was concerned about is that people get the incomes they would ordinarily have. And I think the bill did a reasonably good job of that, could have done better. 
but if people still have a paycheck coming in and they they are the equivalent, I mean, you know, through through other things in there, and the twelve hundred dollars a person, which you know that that certainly is going to help a lot of people. Um, most people should still be in a position where they could pay their rent or mortgage. Um, but again, having this is obviously a crisis period. It's not. It shouldn't be a priority for anyone to do an eviction or a foreclosure right now. So having a moratorium through this crisis period just seems really just common sense. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I guess we're kind of at the end of our segment anyway. Uh, I told everyone to go read you at Beat the Press, and you're going to be coming back on the regular. Is that accurate to keep us? Uh... That's exactly right. So great to see you. And uh, yeah, look forward to uh, being on again next month. Oh, Dean, one final question. Can you take, do you have time for one more? Sure. One more came in just under the wire here. Question again from Lauren. What are the mechanisms driving the coronavirus economic downturn? Is it due to a reduction in spending power by the working class due to businesses closing layoffs, or is it something else? If this is the case, does the challenge, does this challenge the trickle down economic policies that are in vogue? For better or worse, it, it really doesn't have a direct bearing on that. So what's causing the economic downturn is we're forcing you know, businesses to close, restaurants, bars, hotels, uh, airlines. Uh, it, so it's not spending power. It's really that we don't, we, we literally don't want these businesses to open. I got a kick out of this because uh, Glenn Kessler is the fact checker at the Washington Post. I, I, I like him. He don't always agree with him, but he's, he's a decent guy, I think. Anyhow, he tweeted something about how come the airlines aren't being forced to, to refund tickets that, you know, you can't travel. So I guess what they're doing, and I, I'll find this out because I have some tickets, but they're they're deferring it. So you get a credit, you know, so he's saying, why aren't they being, because he goes, that would encourage spending. We don't want spending right now. We want people to stay at home. We want them to be able to get the, the food, get the essentials that they need. And basically that's it. So we don't want to say, oh, here, have some money, go out and spend because that's not what we need people to do right now. We need people to be safe. And so it's not, it's not an issue of not enough spending. It's that the virus is preventing the economy from operating normally. It's actually quite interesting to just watch the clash of values, um, people and protecting lives and communitary, uh, communitary and values versus you know, economics, the drive toward growth, the drive for a uh, continued profit. Um, is it possible we could really pause the economy if we didn't have to pay our mortgages or our rent or our student loans and everything just went on hold? Not just people lost their jobs and we couldn't go to, you know, we can't go to the restaurant and then the restaurant has to close. The only reason the restaurant has to close is because they have to pay their rent and they're not going to be able to pay that rent if they don't have people coming in and eating the food. Why can't we do like an across the board pausing to make sure everyone is still financially secure at the end of this? That's essentially what we want to do. So we, you know, this is going to be this period. And again, I have no particular insights as to how long that will be, whether it's one month, two months, three months, hopefully it's not too long, but you know, it's, this is a period, that's what we should be thinking. We want to keep, I hope you're not getting sick there. Um, you know, we, we want to keep things more or less intact, you know, keep everyone, you know, as, as healthy as we can through this period, and then be in a position to start up again. That's, that's really what we need to do. So the idea, oh, we want people to spend, no, that's absolutely nuts. We want people to stay safe, be with their family, you know, you know, again, obviously, people need food to survive, they need other things to survive, there's no doubt about that. But beyond that, you know, we're not trying to you know, have all these great products and get everyone to spend that just makes zero sense right now. I, I can't hear you now. I know. I, I'm sorry, something happened to my, I don't know, it's my end or your end, but I, I, I can't hear anything. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, no, I, I can hear now. That was there. me. I, I paused uh, my mic so that uh, I didn't sneeze in everyone's ears. Oh. <laughs> Um, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. And by the next time you come on, who knows where we'll be. I'm sure there'll be a lot of interesting things to talk about, though, in terms of... Well, it's after Easter, so all will be good. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Why don't you just come over? <laughs> hey, Dean, thanks. Take care. I really appreciate it. It was nice to meet you uh, in person. Good meeting good you. And yeah, stay healthy. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.